Now, most Nigerians will tell you that this country's security problems are almost innumerable. Everything from piracy to kidnappings, ethnic clashes to armed robbery, and lots more in between. But if there is one group that sums up almost all of the contemporary history of Nigeria's security challenges, at least for the last decade, it would have to be Boko Haram, the group that for years has been on a campaign of terror across northeast Nigeria. But today, their leader, Abubakar Shakao, is dead, his followers are divided, and Boko Haram appears to be on the ropes. But are they really gone, or have they simply been supplanted by a former offshoot of the group known today as the Islamic State West Africa Province, or ISWAP, and therefore there is little reason to celebrate? The issue of terrorist financing is concerned is a work in progress. And uh, indeed, I would like to be preemptive both in terms of investigation, but one thing I can say for sure is arising from such arrest, the terrorist funding and financing has indeed um, been crippled substantially and that eventually translated to some imp major improvements being recorded as far as uh, crippling the strength of um, a t a terrorist is concerned within the nation. You can see visibly that we are indeed wit witnessing tremendous successes associated with the Boko Haram, which uh, translate to significant dissemination uh, of the Boko Haram terrorists. We have succeeded, one, in identifying those that are responsible for funding, two, blocking the leakages associated with the funding, and then three, embarking on aggressive investigation that is indeed uh, impacting positively in terms of the fight against uh, terrorism. And that's the Nigerian Attorney General and Minister for Justice there. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now on the line by Dr. Adebowale Adebo, Chief Operating Officer of the West African Security and Risk Management Group, Halogen Academy. Thank you very much indeed for joining us um you've had your eye on boko haram for many years now and you've watched them even more closely recently is it fair to say that the group is on the ropes today with their leader abubakar shakao dead and their and his followers divided more than ever before thanks for having me charles um very interesting question i mean this is, let's remind ourselves of what we're trying to discuss here and deal with. Uh, over 13 years of Boko Haram um, activities within the Nigerian space and its border, um, in eight years of, of their challenging our um, operating space, we have over 75% of our infrastructure within the particular area they were operating from dissipated. We have over 2.9 million uh, children out of school, um, over 45% of health and other infrastructure destroyed. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves, what do we mean by we've defeated Boko Haram? Um, this is a group uh, that we've attributed over 350,000 deaths to, really, in the last uh, 13 years. Um, we've heard that about 6,000 of their members have uh, surrendered. And one needs to, of course, acknowledge the um, level of effort that we put into fighting this insurgent group by the Nigerian military forces. But of course, you also have to recognize that it's not just the military effort, it's also the death of Abubakar Shekau, their leadership, and also some of the members allegedly moving to join ISWAP. So we really need to understand what this defeat mean and what we mean by success when it comes to you know, the dealing of, with Boko Haram. And we also need to be very cautious about what we are celebrating here, if at all we are. Because we can you know, cite examples in the past of, for example, the FLN in Algeria, the National Liberation Front, that took um, you know, uh, haven, safe haven in places like Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Morocco. So they didn't just disappear. They just eat themselves in other countries uh, that, that will really cater for their need for the time being before they resurrected again. And if you also know, in September 15, just a few days ago, we lost over about six members of the armed forces who were part of the joint operation adding Kai to a, a joint tax force by the military uh, forces of Nigeria. So it's not Hur yet. And I think we need to be cautious that what we are dealing with here is not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
Uh, and for you to claim that you've defeated Boko Haram or any other insurgent group, you must have demobilized, you must have deradicalized, you must have rehabilitated, and you must have reintegrated. Have we done this for? If we haven't, then I don't think we're at there yet to start to claim that we have some element of success. We, I think it's the starting point that we need to acknowledge and encourage in terms of military intervention and military efforts, but it, we are not there yet. It's not yet Uhuru, I have to say, Charles. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed for uh, properly outlining the situation there. I think, in fact, to be fair, the Nigerian government would probably agree with you because, I mean, their suggestion is that Boko Haram is on the ropes, but they're not saying that it's entirely and completely defeated. But I suppose in order to understand where we are today, with um, Boko Haram, um, it's it's important to get a sense of of their the history and how they've evolved over the years. I mean, what was the idea behind Boko Haram in the first place? What did they set out to achieve? Thank you, Charles. I think we need to look at the old notion beyond just Boko Haram. We have to really interrogate what the factors are that contributes to insurgency uh, and what are the uh, reasons that insurgents um, uh, latch on to uh, to create such a force within the nation. It, I mean, the, the tactics are different. If you look at the global history around insurgency, uh, the approaches are different. If you look at what uh, insurgent groups have done in the past. But even in the Nigerian space, one of the things I really think we need to emphasize and educate ourselves about is that we have about five or six active groups in the Nigerian environment. So the overemphasis on Boko Haram sometimes worry me because we might lose it if we don't recognize that we're dealing with more than one group that are troubling our, our regional space as a nation. So we have Boko Haram, um, which literally means book is a ram, uh, book, book is not right, and you know education, the, the Western education format is not something that they, they want to support. But it's beyond that. I mean, you, you also have to recognize that we have the Jamaat Nusrat Hal Islam Wal Muslim, JNIM, who also operate within our space and our borderline. We have ISWAP, the Islamic State of West Africa, the group that we mentioned earlier. We have the Islamic State Greater Sahara, ISGS. We have Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM. We have Hal Murabaton, and we have Ansar Dini. So these groups are, you know, all operating within our space at a different level of capacity, of course and different level of impact in terms of our nation state. So therefore, we also need to be careful about the narrative and the concept and the nomenclature we throw around in terms of who do we have backed up the ropes, who have we defeated or somewhat defeated, who are we fighting? Because we are not clear about who is it that we are trying to uh, you know, suppress within our nation state. We wouldn't really get the right strategy to address it. And again, let's quickly say, that this news around, you know, they are now backed off or we're dealing with them, they, they run away and 6,000 have, have, have you know, surrendered. We've, we've been here before as a nation. I mean, if you remember... If right. Uh, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, uh, Doctor, but I mean, I'm, I'm focusing on Boko Haram for the simple reason we're going to get to ISWAP and all the rest of them, but we want to get to Boko Haram because that's the group that's being talked about as having been... Um, degraded considerably and I'm trying to understand where they came from why they started doing what they did and how they've evolved over the years because when they first started as a group they were led by Muhammad Yusuf and were they a violent group at that stage at that stage, they were an evolving group with connection uh, within and outside the Nigerian space, international network, to be candid. But again, let's go back to the track history around Boko Haram insurgency and what we've done as, as a nation and where we are now. And that's what I meant about we've been here before. In you know, 2015, 2016, uh, there was some depletion of, of their group by, by you know, um, active intervention of the military then. And in, as, in, as a nation, we made some gains towards the end of 2017. But before that, in 20, 2009, there was a big government crackdown as well. And in 2010, I think Abu Bakr Shikau became the leader, and that revived the group again. And then when we, in 2013, during the uh, President Jonathan um, presidency, there was an intensified military effort as well to tackle Boko Haram. 
But again, it's, remember in 2014 was when we had the 276 Chibok girls kidnapped. So the question is, did we ever have them against the rope? Well, I mean, did we actually, you know, uh, uh, got to a stage where we were challenging them? In 2015, there were a new offensive by um, M MNTJF, the Joint Task Force Force, a coalition between the Republic of Bene, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. Uh, and that gave us a bit of I mean, leverage as well in tackling the issue. But by 2018, ISWAP raised his head and they established themselves in places like Borne, Yobo, uh, Bono, beg your pardon, Yobe, and Adamawa states. So I'm cautious in really talking about we've got them backed off, we've got them surrendering, and we're nearly there. Uh, I think the military needs to be also be somewhat circumspect in, in sharing with us the narrative of success um, so that we are not creating a scenario where we are false hope and we are not really there yet and Nigerians are believing why we are there yet. If you look at you know history of social psychology of security, even in Europe where the level of insecurity is below 10 digits, the fear of crime and the fear of insecurity is always between 72 and 76 percent. So even in societies where we don't have high level of insecurity, there's a substantial level of fear of insecurity. Now compare that to Nigeria where we have both. So I think it's important that we manage the communication we managed the transition from okay, where we are now I understand to where we are. that. Uh, we, we've got less than a minute before we have to take a break. But just following the sequence historically, could it be said that Abu Bakr Shekau, when he took over in 2010, deviated from the path for Boko Haram that Muhammad Yusuf uh, uh, had set and essentially remade the group in his own image, which was a much more violent group? Absolutely. I mean, the, the nature of leadership of any, any group of such um, character and feature is such that the leadership shape uh, the DNA or reshape the DNA of the group, refocus the group to another strategic agenda that suits its own ideology and, and you know, interpretation of what the group is all about. I mean, it's common among social groups, it's common among religious groups, and therefore, of course, common among uh, insurgent groups as well. Uh, so any agitating group of people, we tend to have leadership that reform and reshape and restructure and refocus it. Right, uh, okay. Well, please stay with us uh, because we, we want to talk with you some more. Uh, you're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the apparent demise of Boko Haram and the rise of another jihadist group, Iswar. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyagolu. Now, for many years, the security situation in Nigeria has been synonymous with one name, Boko Haram. The horrendous kidnappings and suicide attacks in the country's northeast region and in neighboring countries that border the Lake Chad Basin brought them attention and infamy around the world. Who can ever forget the abduction of the Chibok girls and the bombing of the UN office and this day newspaper facilities in Abuja? But over the last couple of years, the group's influence has been slipping, and in the last few months, Boko Haram's waning capacity appears to have accelerated. So how has it all unfolded? And Dr. Adebowale Adebo, Chief Operating Officer of the West African Security and Risk Management Group, Halogen Academy, is still with me on the line from London. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And, and you mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier. It was in 2014, wasn't it, that Abu Bakr Shekau decided to pledge the allegiance of Boko Haram to Islamic State, of course, the group controlling parts of Syria and Iraq, and was trying to form a caliphate. So, on the one hand, Boko Haram became part of the global jihadist network, which would seem to make it more powerful. But that was when things began to fall apart, wasn't it, with Boko Haram? Um, was it, really? Uh, again, what do we mean by fall apart? Like any group of such nature where, like I said earlier, the leadership form and frame what the focus should be, uh, you will tend to have individuals there that don't agree with such ideology. 
And the unfortunate thing we have globally now is that there are options. I mentioned earlier six major groups, including Boko Haram, the Operation in Nigeria, and Space. So there are options for these guys to go. For anybody who wants to become a leader at some stage, so you have the leadership quest within this group. Uh, and so you have a bit of dissipation of membership. But what we need to be careful about is the level of, um, uh, if you like, empathy that some group of individuals within and outside the Nigerian space have for Boko Haram or whatever it stands for. And when you have a group that, you know, kind of foil itself, um, electrify itself based on empathy, sometimes based on religious affiliation, sometimes based on certain sets of belief, or sometimes based on certain ethnic uh, coloration, membership uh, is not an issue for them. I mean, if you, if you remember the, 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 the model in, in, in kidnapping, the, the, you know, there are situations where the kidnappers and the kidnapped uh, start to affiliate with themselves. So we really need to be cautious that we, we don't see that uh, as something that we can prey on as and, and argue is giving us a chance to understand Boko Haram better. Because what we have not done properly is to deep dive into the root causes why we have Boko Haram in the first place. Right. Well, that, that's a good point you're making because it's those root causes that I'm trying to get at how things have evolved to where they are today. Because from what I understand, and you know this probably better than I do, senior Boko Haram leaders were becoming disenchanted with Shekau. He demanded complete loyalty, but they felt that he was going too far with his killing of civilians, using people as bombs, etc. And even IS's central leadership decided that he was too extreme. But Shekau refused to quit after IS appointed a new leader, Al Banawi, and so the group split into two factions. Is that how the story goes so far? I'm trying to get the historical evolution. Uh, absolutely. That there was definitely a time where there was a disintegration around the leadership of Boko Haram. Uh, Shekau's stance was not very helpful. Those that he had international affiliations and relationship and partnership with uh, disagreed with him in terms of his style and his model. Um, and of course, I sense that will have even affected uh, some of their sources of funding. And then when Al Banawi came, came, came on board, it, it was a different approach entirely. They wanted to go back uh, to the old model of Boko Haram that started fundamentally uh, as a group that uh, aimed to agitate for and amplify a particular religious uh, belief. Uh, but Shekau departed from that in terms of the level of militancy that he demonstrated, which had major impact on, on us as a nation and our military uh, facilities and, and people in the northeast of Nigeria and did not where subsequently, uh, and now we're where we are. So, I mean, those are part of the issues within any group. And if you look at the you know, uh, Taliban in, in Afghanistan, um, where, where there was a leadership change, you had a similar scenario that, that played out. So, it's, and if you, if you go to Syria and, and the groups that operate within Syria and those that are still operating in Iraq today, you have similar scenarios playing out. So these elements and these fundamentals are, are not new when it comes to insurgency group, especially when powers are coerced and the nature of leadership is one that is driven by force and in some cases driven by some uh, common and shared ideology. Right. But that so, actually, created that crack that led to where we are today. Okay. The, so, so then they start to fight each other and they've been doing so off and on for the last five or six years. But clearly, ISWAP was the more dominant force, wasn't it? I mean, with reports suggesting they had many more fighters than Boko Haram. Oh, absolutely. I mean, ISWAP is now, you know, if you like, the, the, the golden kid on the block in terms of insurgency within our space. Again, let's remind ourselves that of the 6,000 odd estimated people that, you know, um, surrendered to the Nigerian military forces, we have quite a number of them that have moved to Cameroon. So like I said, we need to be very cautious that some of the disenchanted membership of Boko Haram have not gone into safe haven, similar to what we had in FLN in Algeria many years ago. And we had countries that will have sympathy uh, with such individuals and such groups. So it, we, we need to ensure that part of the intervention we put in place now that we have a bit of a headway is an international dimension to how we deal with Boko Haram. Definitely diplomatic um, approaches will be hugely important at this stage and a stronger border control that is supported by strong military forces alongside um, uh, technology being supporting the way they operate will now be required.
Right. Because what okay. We to do is to is to relax. Well, let, let me just come in there because the, the question that everybody is asking is now that Abu Bakr Shekau is incontrovertibly dead, what does that mean for the future of Boko Haram? Because, I mean, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't, you know, relax about them, but the fact remains that we haven't seen the remnants of that group carrying out attacks as it used to. Okay. Now, one of the challenges a nation faces when you have insurgency is the military intervention which one is to commend in terms of the, the level of uh, uh, interaction with the insurgency now leading us to the results we've recorded in the last few weeks is important. But what we need to do is to start to self-reflect as a nation, to ask ourselves, you know, what lessons should we learn, can we learn from the experience of the last 13, 14 odd years? So we need to kind of reflect on that and, and pull out some core lessons. But what is also more important is how we deal with where we are now and our readiness to ensure that we sustain a nation that will lack insurgency now in the future. And one of those I, I, points I mentioned earlier is the whole idea of root causes. What's what got us to where we are in the first place? And we know some of those factors, you know, poor governance, corruption, ethnicity, poor infrastructure, the level of poverty, someone living below, you know, $2 a, 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 a month. It's a situation that will, you know, trigger the kind of insurgency that we've experienced in the last 13, 14 years. We also need to look at the drivers of insecurity as a nation. What do we need to strengthen in terms of systems and infrastructure? Okay. Well, you, you've made some very good points there. We've got less than a minute before we have to end the chat. As Boko Haram seems to be declining, is ISWAP getting stronger and now trying to project its caliphate ambitions in northeastern Nigeria? I would argue that with the decline of Boko Haram, and I hope it is a sustainable decline, the groups like ISWAP, GNIM, ISGS, AQIM needs to be looked up for. We shouldn't just focus just on ISWAP. We should look at the other groups operating within our space and see how we can deplete and annihilate the group. Um, I, I wouldn't want us to have a narrow approach to this. Anyone in the international space will tell you that in dealing with insurgency, a multi-dimensional approach is required. Okay. What we shouldn't allow to happen is the Taliban example in Afghanistan. Right, okay. And Dr. Adebowale Adebo, Chief Operating Officer of the West African Security and Risk Management Group, Halogen Academy. Thank you very much indeed for joining us there from London.